Hello everyone, welcome to Practical GCB. Today I'll be talking about running Apache Spark jobs on a serverless data proc cluster. And the main focus will be how do I do this via the custom container runtime. So today's agenda contains a number of topics. Um, first of all, I'll talk about what is data proc. Um, if you haven't used it before, uh, I'll do a quick intro. Data proc versus serverless data proc. There's actually two ways you can run data proc, um, and then I'll talk about the differences. The custom container on data proc, I'll go through that. There's actually a, a very interesting topic about running this with serverless and running this without serverless. Then I'll use a real world use case, and then this is gonna be a diagram to showcase uh, uh, a, a scenario, you know, how you can use Spark and how you can actually trigger Spark jobs um, using the Google services. Uh, as usual, I'll talk through the code so you know uh, how I put this whole thing together end-to-end uh, -to -end with all of the necessary components required. Uh, demo time, uh, show, you in, show you exactly how this works, uh, how the job get triggered with the serverless Spark, and, and is including how the auto-scaling works. And finally, we do a summary. Okay, first of all, what is data proc? Uh, it's a fully managed and highly scalable service for running Apache Hadoop, Apache Spark, Apache Flink, Presto, and many other open source tools and frameworks. But from my knowledge, it's the most of all useful things that people do or use it for these days are for running Apache Spark jobs. Right, that's, the, Spark's probably the only thing, one of the only things kind of left um, that are still very popular that lots of people use. Uh, and this is what Dataproc uh, allows you to run on the Google Cloud. So what's the difference between Dataproc and the serverless one? Um, if you look at this, it's not actually that much of a difference. Uh, this is the, uh, the from the, the page that Google uh, explained. And so some of the biggest differences I would say is um, in terms of the infrastructure control, obviously this is serverless, you don't have to manage any infrastructure, there's nothing, you just submit the job, it runs and it dies, right? There's nothing. In here, obviously you need to create a cluster yourself um, and then submit jobs against it. And this probably doesn't make that much of a difference to you uh, if you just run Spark jobs. Uh, the resource management, this is Spark based for the Databox serverless one. And then the the computer ver engine based version is using Yarn, which is the same as, you know, if you have the one that runs on the uh, Cloudera uh, 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 enterprise version, right? So this is kind of identical to that. Um, it does not support GPU in the serverless Spark. So if you want that, you have to wait, uh, but it does support it on the other side. Um, the other things are kind of quite minor. So the custom containers, I'll, I think this probably means you can use customer container to create the base cluster, you know, what you're gonna deploy the cluster with, but not necessarily the one I'm talking about today, which is the runtime. So when you execute your jobs and which one you're gonna use. Um, so, and then uh, a few things, the, the Java versions, if you, you cannot use anything uh, before Java uh, 11, so this is Java 11 is used in the serverless one, and then the previous version are supported in the old, uh, in the com computer engine one, uh, OS logging is not supported, right? Uh, so this, some of the differences, you can go through this in detail. Um, uh, this is hyperlinked, that you can click on it when I share the slide, and then you can find where this is talked about from the Google Docs. So on this page, I've included two parts. So one is uh, about using the custom containers with data proc serverless, and then the other one is with Yarn. So let's have a look at this one first. So to put it in a nutshell, for uh, there's a default container that you can use to run, but if you have dependencies, it's a bit of a nightmare to manage that. If you use the custom containers with the data proc, uh, you can actually build your own image using Docker, right? And then uh, specify that image as the one you want to use when you do the Spark submit via the serverless Spark, uh, serverless data proc. So one thing to keep in mind is do not include Spark in your custom container image because this is the one that gets attached into your con the container you're, you build, right, at runtime. Um, so the, one of the th very important things I want to talk about is this is the one of the example containers the image uh, that Google have given you, which is why I use it and it does work. Um, so this gives you a way to uh, 
build the container with uh, very close to the to the ones that is the it's the default this is probably where it's coming from uh, but what you can do is as you can see you can install all of these python dependencies right that you need in this case i'm uh from from the use case i use it's going to be PySpark based but you can install all of this stuff and then you can also uh include additional python packages and then at the very top you also have additional uh, jars so for example the bigquery with dependencies if it doesn't have it or on the base one you can actually add it so i don't know exactly what it doesn't have in the base one because in the word count example i use it has to read from gcs right so and then that already has the jar for required in order to talk to google cloud storage so it has most of these things installed but this does take a very very long time to build i think for me is what about 20 25 minutes uh, that it took to build um, but once it's done you can actually uh, submit the job you know this using this command in here you can use the gcloud command to submit the job uh, which i have given in the source code as example but obviously you can also do this via a rest api call um, in this case uh, which i'll talk about with the use case right the, the a real world use case and then how this can be useful uh, to you as a user and uh, the other one is uh, the spark drop runtime on the yarn so i've not actually tried this myself but if you pay attention to this section you can actually see the docker file given in here it is exactly identical to the one is used on a serverless one so i've not tried this but this is interesting because if you build this uh, what it can do later on is this right so when you submit a spark drop to the cluster, so keep in mind this is not serverless, you can specify these as attributes specifically if you look at these, this one, the yarn container runtime docker image. So you can use your own docker image, right, on the uh, the non-serverless data product cluster as well. Uh, so then this would basically behave exactly the same way. So you don't necessarily have to do serverless. Um, although I would prefer always go serverless unless you have very good reason not to because it's just easier you don't have to manage any infrastructure uh, but if you don't have that option um, it seems this is actually an identical way to build the image that you can submit of spark drops but it looks like it's quite a lot more work because you have to kind of uh, specify all of these runtime at a very low level uh, in order to run your uh, spark drops in a container uh, sorry, run your spark drops in the normal kind of data proc uh, cluster via your container image you build, right? It's just good to keep in mind there's actually the container runtime uh, work with serverless and it seems also work with non-serverless. Okay, so that's kind of the two things and the two ways you can use the container uh, runtime for data proc. Right, let's look at a use case. Assume you're a user, right? you uh, may have a cloud run application that has a interactive user interface that you for you to collect and input some parameters which can also be called reference data so those things can affect how you spark drop behaves and what kind of data it generates at the back of that right let's say this is a pi spark batch drop you're trying to run here and so the right hand side in here, right, is our building process that we showed on the last page of the custom uh, Spark Docker file, the container. So you build this via cloud build and then package all of the dependencies you need, which the base image may not have, um, and then push that into artifact registry. And this can then be used in the Spark runtime dynamically. So the user specifies some parameters, right? Then, then they say, okay, now I want to call and do the Spark submit on the data proc cluster. In this case, if it's serverless, um, you don't have a cluster, right? All you have to do is to dynamically make the call to do Spark submit via the Google API. So this is interesting. Uh, if you're coming from the kind of Hadoop ecosystem with Cloudera or with other kind of distributions of Hadoop in on-prem uh, outside of the cloud environment, you would have noticed it's actually a very complicated process to orchestrate this. You need to um, 
you need to have some physical machines here to just uh, you know deploy it via uh, those master node. You know, do the, some R things, and then it's it's just very very tricky to actually do a Spark submit job. So it's it's it's, it's not slick at all. But with this, um, let's say you run in this use case, your a call is coming from Cloud Run. Cloud Run is a Google service. It has a service count, right? That service count, all it needs to have is a role to be able to submit the data proc serverless job on, on, on here, right? And then because this, this is a Google service, this is a Google service, you can make this call and then submit this via the REST API or gcloud command using the private Google Connect. So this thing uh, does not require any sort of like a ports, you know, firewalls and kind of opening on the, um, in order to talk to the data proc cluster, right? In order to talk to the, the you know, do the serverless submission or talk to the data proc cluster, whether it's serverless or not. Uh, so this is the most important part. Then it runs the Spark job, pull the runtime from the container image, run the job, and then uh, put your output in the into the GCS bucket. So I didn't actually include input output, but typically you have your input files that you will need to use to run your jobs. This is typically your data. And then you have your output that the insight that the Spark job generates in a different cloud storage bucket. Right, so let's talk about the code. There's a lot to go through in here. So in this code repository, it contains two parts. Everything outside here is about to um, the word count application. Very simple, nothing complicated. Just the word count takes input with the GCS file location with lots of files and then the output. And they will output the word count results, right? That's that's all it is. Um, the Docker file, which is the most important part, this is the one that Google provided, uh, but I've made a few changes by moving some of these, uh, the things that you could change more often uh, to the very bottom because the Docker image can be cached and you can reuse the previous one. Um, so you don't have to go through the 20, 30 minutes building process again. Um, so this including copy the jars and adding customized Python modules. But this is basically your uh, custom doc image for the runtime. The, uh, the data proc submit. So this is actually something I've trying out initially. Uh, you can actually use this as an independent thing, but later I will show you how do I uh, how I actually embedded this into the Cloud Run app. But this is basically a version uh, you can use to submit the Spark job via the REST API. So the following uh, in the README, uh, I'll go through this very quickly. I've got this bit that I it can be used to generate uh, some large files. Why is that important? Because if you look at here, I've generated a very kind of size of 200, 500 megabytes of files with lots of words in it. Uh, the one thing I want to do, which I'll show in a demo later on, is to trigger the auto scaling to see how it actually scales in the serverless mode uh, to see if there's any issues that I can I can see um, uh, compared to the normal one. Um, and this section is all about running Spark on a serverless data proc side. Um, so one of the important ones I want to mention is in the service account for uh, for the Spark uh, service account, and there's a typo here, apologies, you've got uh, to have the artifact registry reader if you're putting pushing it to artifact registry, even this is in the same project, because I had this problem is for some reason it couldn't pull the image uh, at the runtime when it runs the Spark job. So you need the artifact registry reader in order for, for you to, to read it. And obviously you needed the data proc worker, otherwise you can't run the jobs. The storage object admin is to read uh, and write to the bucket that it needs to uh, read the data from. Uh, you For production users, obviously you want more granular permissions, but for this one, I basically give you access to all of the, the objects in all of the buckets I've created. And then, uh, if you're not using the default network, you need to provide a subnet as well. Uh, one the one of the most important things that took me a bit of time because I didn't read documentation, again, one of these uh, scenarios, um, is you need to open the ingress rules, right, for your private network. So 
all this does is to allow the so this is nothing about opening things to public. All this does is to allow the uh, the master node and the worker nodes to be able to communicate with each other. Uh, if you don't do this, it will get stuck. It will just keep saying cannot uh, spin up workers, uh, and then you keep retrying, keep retrying. So, but this is very very important. You need the ingress rule set, otherwise it won't work. And this is the example of how to submit uh, the job via G Cloud. So this is the example you've given in the Google documentation, but I put it together with a, a quite a comprehensive, all the parameters you need for a close to production use case, because this has the regions, has the container image, has the uh, dependencies bucket. So this is kind of the processing or the staging bucket. You've got a service count, the customer service count you use, not the default one, the subnet you use. The distribution, sorry, the runtime version, this is the, the version two on Dataproc. And then the properties you can adjust, which um, you can see there's a number of uh, uh, things you can adjust in here on how the auto scaling behaves. Uh, and then the double dash with a space is basically then the uh, argument parameters for your PySpark job, right? So what I've done is I have uh, uh, copied uh, the word count.py into the uh, code bucket. So you want a dedicated bucket for your code. So keep in mind, this is where you put your code not this has nothing to do with the custom image you're building right don't put code in there code is separate uh, so the whole point is you put all the dependencies in the custom container image and then you put your code completely independently right so this means when you run your code in here uh, you can deploy your code without keep rebuilding your containers the container is a runtime the code is the thing you actually change um, you know very very often right you can also run it locally uh, to test your stuff and um, this also works Okay, um, the more interesting thing is what I've done, actually done is I deployed a Dataproc trigger app, right? This is kind of a, something that has a user, user interface uh, to Cloud Run, and this allows you to do, this. what this allows you to do is to, using a UI as the scenario I've described earlier, to trigger the Spark drop instead of using G Cloud, because if you're using G Cloud, it's kind of quite, difficult uh, to, to do that because it's just not uh, very slick. But if you use the app to trigger it, uh, that's actually making a lot more useful than just using G Cloud command. Keep in mind a few things in there. The uh, service count you need, uh, you know, the ones that to trigger uh, the the job, the data proc job is data proc admin. So because this is administrator action, right, to, to submit the job. And then you need a service account token creator and a service account user. Otherwise, you won't be able to use the service account you're trying to use in here for the application um, when when it does the kind of the triggering. Um, so just keep in mind you need these in order to use it. And that again is the G Cloud uh, command for Cloud Build for deploying the Cloud Run service. Um, just going into a little bit into Cloud Run service. There's a few things going on here. Uh, is is a very simple app. But within the app, uh, what you've got is uh, the code I showed you earlier with all of these environment variables set uh, to do the service to service uh, communication from Cloud Run to Dataproc uh, in order to submit the job. Uh, this is something I've been through in the uh, one of the other videos. Uh, when you, what you can do is when you run a Google service, um, you can get the default, uh, the default uh, auth token, which is the bearer token that you can send to, you know, trigger other service calls, because this is basically what this service account on uh, you attach to the Cloud Run service in this case that gives you. So this is the code that you can actually do it. Uh, but it's a bit of a fab because when you do it locally for local development, it uses a different way because you're not in the Google service context. But when you're actually in the Google service uh, context, such as Cloud Run, you can actually retrieve the token in this way. And this code, Basically, uh, you can see this is the REST API call, which took me a while to put this together because there is no, um, uh, one of the things is doesn't it just, there is no Python SDK to do this, at least I can't find it. So you kind of have to construct the payload yourself and you know putting all of this stuff you, yourself together and then, then trigger the job. Uh, but you can actually, this is kind of, you can, it's not exactly um, best templated, but you can easily change it to a template for your own use case to trigger the jobs. Um, and here, 
all it does is to pass the token is retrieved from the um, the Cloud Run instance itself, then make a call, uh, then return this. I'll show you in a second in a demo uh, how this actually works end to end. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, you've got, again, just in summary, in everything outside, you've got a word count, you've got some code that can help you to generate some large files to do the, the word count. The dataproc submit.py is uh, an independent one. If you don't, you know, you want to use this somewhere else, not um, as part of an app, you can use this in, you know, cloud, track into Cloud Composer or track, track to other places that you can actually also trigger the, um, the dataproc job. Okay, that's what the code does. So now next, let's have a look how this actually works. So first of all, I'll show you the service I've actually deployed. This is the Cloud Run service that's been deployed. I opened this to public for the time being. Uh, I'll do a different video on how to do a kind of private one via IAP uh, another day via Cloud Run, uh, which is now in GA. But in this case, I uh, just open it to public and then so you can see the front end app. I can use the front end app to actually uh, trigger this for you. Um, if you look at this, if I click on this link, so all I did was a app, you know, this is the front page, the index page, and then I will use this to trigger a data proc job. So remember what I said earlier was this, uh, it has all of the environment variables set. Actually, I'm gonna show you this, uh, here in um, revisions. If you look at this, all of these environment variables are set. And so this is about, you know, the, the version you want to kind of, uh, the version of the Spectre we want to trigger because it's built, you know, on the other side with the container. Um, yeah, so the service kind you want to use for the Spark side, the subnet, when you use for the Spark side, where did you store the Python file, right? This input bucket of all of your data and then the output where you want to put your data when a job finishes. So it's all here. Um, and then when it triggers a job, it typically, yeah, it just makes a call and then it gives you the information uh, returned back. And so this is asynchronous, you know, it triggers the call. Um, but, but what you can do is if you want to make your front end app is a bit more interactive, you can trigger the job, right? This is the Spark submit uh, with the batch, but also you can actually tr uh, list the job. You can see what's running. Uh, it will return the ID in this case. This is the return ID for you. And then you can actually check the status of the job. This is where, where it got to. And then when it's finished, you can on your UI, you say it's finished. You know, this is actually something you can do interactively using this uh, uh, internal API call. And uh, if you look at the patches, you can see I've been trying this quite a bit already. Uh, this uh, just been triggered 45 seconds ago. This is our PySpark drop that got triggered from the UI. If you look into it, you can see all of the parameters has been passed through in the details. You can see the service counts being used, the region, the version, the runtime version, the uh, where the Python file is, the input bucket, output bucket, image. This, this is the container that we build, the runtime it will pull to run. And then also in here, you've got the uh, the things we set in here on the executors. Yeah. So. While this is running, um, I will show you the one I had previously, so you don't have to wait. So the one I had previously took five minutes. So what I've done is I've set to the worker to a minimum of two, uh, maximum of 50 with a auto scaler, right? So, and then you can see here, and then by default, uh, it started with two workers and this matrix basically saying I need more workers. And because it didn't actually take much time in total, the auto scaler just about to kick in, and you can see it scale it up to three. See, it's got to, it's got to three, it's got to zero. So the, the, this is the demand, and then you've got the supply in here. Then it's finished. So if you look at the, uh, so this is obviously the the input bucket, but if you look at the output bucket, so I've created a few of these. So that's the output. So you can see in here, uh, this is the latest one it had, uh, yeah, and then, right, that's still running, it's not finished yet, uh, but if you look at the previous run, you can see these are all the parts, right, so these are the, the generated one from the word count after the uh, flat map, right? 
Um, yeah, so also, if you go back to the run one that's currently running, uh, yeah, you can see this is this is coming back again. So it's got two running and it's got demand eight. Um, what you can do is also to click on view logs. So this will help you to debug the application because I've used this quite a bit because initially I missed a few permissions uh, and I have issues with uh, with uh, kind of pulling the image from uh, artifact registry. I had issues with the network. Um, so that, but that's all in the readme. So just make sure you read it um, uh, carefully. So then you don't miss any of these details and like spending quite a lot of time to try to make this work. Yeah, but this is basically the Spark run logs. And uh, you can see this this is going on. And in a bit, you can also see the auto scaler kicking in on this run as well. Um, but yeah, but you get an idea. Uh, right, there you go. Okay, let's do a bit of summary. Um, so first of all, uh, running data proc in serverless mode is very simple, clean and cost effective. Uh, it's very simple, you don't have any infrastructure to run. In, in this particular case, you've got containers and then it will help you to manage all the dependencies together. It's very clean, you don't have anything you need to clean up. And then it's cost effective because you don't have to leave any containers running. So there's no cost if you don't run anything, right? So keep that in mind. So the custom container is very useful to package all dependencies via Docker. So this is exactly one of the problems it solves with Docker is you don't have to have a bits here, bits there for all of your dependencies in, in the buckets, like what it, uh, how it used to run before. So you can just put it all together in a Docker container, then you know do a Spark submit via the private API, and now you're done. The, Custom container image only needs to be rebuilt when dependencies change. So just keep in mind you need to split the the the, the container image is just for the runtime, right? It's where you run your code. But don't put your code in there. Your code stays separately, um, which goes into a GCS bucket. So you only rebuild your container images when your dependencies change, and that doesn't happen very often. Um, auto scaling can be fine-tuned via Spark properties. So the 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 few Spark properties I showed you. And then, so these can be uh, uh, helpful in terms of tuning the um, uh, how aggressive you want auto scaler to be, and then the minimum and maximum uh, you want the auto scaler to to go up to or to go back to. So those are the things you can tune. But obviously, you can also use the other Spark properties that's not listed by by Google's recommendations. Um, but yeah, so you can actually tune it quite well. So you can see the ones that I've done. Uh, it it went up. Um, uh, to just a little bit because the total amount of time was if only five minutes to do the workouts. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm actually quite surprised the serverless data product startup time is quicker than the normal one. Usually it's the other way around. Uh, but that's definitely a good thing because it makes things a lot easier uh, to, you know, you don't have to wait uh, for much. It's 60 seconds. So from my experience, like when you got it set up properly, um, you don't have any, you know, missing any permissions. It, it typically starts around that time, which is very quick. Downside, custom container images building is very slow. Uh, you know, not not exact. It's probably not necessarily a downtime. You can probably reduce the amount of packages you install in there if you don't need them. Uh, but Google kind of recommended you close it, uh, keep it close to the base image. But if you do want to run some lightweight workload, it's questionable whether you want to put everything in there in the first place. Um, but if you do. Use the fat image. Be smart on where to put frequently changed dependencies because otherwise it has to rebuild the whole thing. And then if you rebuild the whole thing, it takes a very very long time. Uh, the one thing that's really kind of uh, is a little bit annoying is because it doesn't have Python SDK or any SDK for triggering the serverless data proc job. So the one I showed you is the one I had to unpack from this, right? So this is the this is the REST API. So you, you can get a REST API and then you see, okay, what, what does it need? It needs a badge and then you go to the badge, you look at what does it need in here and then you, okay, you need a runtime info. So you kind of, so it took me a kind of good hour or two to actually unpack this and then finding out exactly what this does. But the documentation on this side is, is really good. It's just, it doesn't have examples of, you know, any SDKs in Python, for example, then it's a bit of a, uh, it's quite time consuming and it's a bit clunky as well uh, to that I have to use the, the, the REST API. Okay, uh, that's the everything I wanted to cover today. And thank you for listening. Um, 
Hopefully you find uh, this useful and then you know try out the serverless one. I have not tried the custom image for the non-serverless data proc, but if you get a chance, try that too. I think it will work because it's identical image and it's got all the documentation suggests it will work anyways. So you have two options in there if for some reason serverless spec is not the right fit for you. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you next time. Go, go, go.